Hello and welcome back to Amazing Chest. Today we'll be trying to beat Dark Souls 3 while playing as Ariandel's resident Ice Queen, Sister Frida. In the game's lore, Frida, or El Frida, is an unkindled, meaning that at some point she tried to beat the game herself and failed. It isn't known whether she tried to link or usurp the flame, but dialogue from her sister Yuria and her actions in Ariandel seem to imply that she might have tried to link it. Today, we're going to find out how things would have gone if we were the ones controlling Frida on her mission to link the flame. In addition to every required boss, I'll also be using Frida to take on every optional one as well so that we can gain a better understanding for how she'd actually fare if she pursued either ending. As always, we play on max new game difficulty and this video will not end until we defeat Gale. Thanks to the first Hunter Apprentice who created this mod, we'll be playing as Frida's first and third phases with the ability to switch between the two at will. Also, I just announced another community challenge where I'm giving away $1,000 to whoever can kill Gale the fastest from a new character. You can expect that video to come out next week, so make sure you subscribe so you don't miss it. I think that's pretty much everything. If you have any questions about anything, leave a comment below. This one actually took a long time for me to make, so enjoy. So versus Gundir, Frida has a lot of tools. In this fight, the first thing you want to do is... Hold on a second, why isn't he moving? That's weird. Sorry, let me see if I can... Wait a minute. Is that Honkai Impact? This video is sponsored by Honkai Impact 3rd, who were generous enough to help contribute to our third challenges prize pool. Honkai Impact 3rd is a gorgeous game, and its newest version, Silverwing Beyond, is now available. This version brings you new characters as well as more clues about the game's lore, a post honkai odyssey. All of this is presented in a giant open world and in it you can play as a number of characters. One of them is the high tech and elegant Branya. As the first ranger character, Branya has grown to become more versatile. She attacks with both a gun and a sword and she can hit enemies air to ground and ground to air, making combat spectacular and challenging. She's not alone though, by her side is Guinevere. I I mean Timido, a figure skater who strings together kicks and jets of ice into unpredictable combos. In this update, players can explore new areas such as False Bay and the Dungeon of Gates using the game's specially designed grappling hook to reach every corner for chests. Outfits are also amazing in this update. You can choose different battle suits like Miss Pink and Valkyrie Dawn to crank the cuteness level up to 11. Download Honkai Impact 3rd now to redeem my gift code for 30 crystals, 2,888 Astrite, and a Hersher trial card. Back to the video. As I mentioned before, Frida, just like the player, is an unkindled. And I like to imagine that if she were to ever be judged by Gundir, then she would pass with flying colors. The speed and utility of her expansive moveset make it extremely difficult for Gundir to keep up with her, and this shouldn't really come as a surprise because he is, after all, the first boss. But with that said, there isn't really much to discuss about this fight aside from the fact that his crippling weakness to Frost means that he doesn't have a snowball chance in hell at winning this fight. Vort didn't go down as easily though. As soon as his fight starts, I switch into phase 3 because if it wasn't already obvious from his giant icy exterior, he is completely immune to frostbite and very resistant to physical attacks. That means that for this fight, you'll want to rely on Frida's black flame attacks since they do fire damage. At least. That's what I thought. As it turns out, this move actually does physical damage and for that reason isn't too helpful in this fight. What is helpful, however, is our arsenal of ice attacks which actually inflict magic damage and when that damage builds up, any enemies that aren't immune to the frostbite status become afflicted by it and they'll take additional damage as a result. This is a concept that'll come into play multiple times during this run and it is a cornerstone of Frida's game plan. After dodging his second phase dash attacks, I go for an ice jump and the magic damage from the ice crystals ironically, well, melts for it. While I'm in the area, I figured I would just go ahead and take on the dancer now and I kind of regretted it because I was still getting used to Frida's moveset this early in the run. This is the complete list of all of her moves in this mod and I'm going to try and do my best to showcase all of them but it's a lot to keep up with. This fight is where Frida's weaknesses really started to become apparent. In a stark contrast to my previous few runs, like the Soul of Cinder one where I had party members to take aggro, or even the Dragon Slayer armor run where I had a giant shield to hide behind, Frida is entirely reliant on her mobility to stay alive. 
In addition to her Bloodborne-esque Frida Dash and Frida Jump, she also has the ability to run in this mod, which you never end up seeing in her boss fight. Can you imagine what that fight would be like if Frida could actually run? That would be terrifying. Regardless, while our mobility helps, Frida's lack of poise and low HP did hold us back at some points. My rematch with the dancer begins with me laying an ice trap on the ground for her and she walks right into it. Afterward, I follow up with an R2 and then I'm forced to dodge when she tries to retaliate. Phase 1, Frida has access to this awesome jump attack which lets me stagger the dancer so I can land an ice jump and get some huge damage in. At this point, I'm running low on stamina and this will be a recurring theme throughout this run because Frida's movement and her attacks require a ton of it. The dancer and I size each other up for a bit and then I pull the trigger first by going for an ice trap which explodes shortly after laying it on the ground. I'm running low on stamina again so I back off while she goes into phase 2 and a timely Frida jump lets me narrowly avoid her plunging attack. With one final combo into a black flame jump, the dancer goes down and I'm able to finish this fight off in style. Up next is our first optional fight and because this one was so long, I'm gonna go ahead and only cover the important parts. I hope that's okay. The first thing you'll want to do in this fight is go for the sacks on the Great Wood's arms and legs. I wouldn't really worry too much about the undead peasants in the area because while Frida does have the tools to hold her own in group fights, the Great Wood itself will take care of the undead on its own throughout the course of the fight. The sack on its stomach is definitely the most dangerous one to destroy, but Frida can use her black flame to slowly chip away at it from afar. Now if this attack did fire damage then this fight would go so much easier considering that this tree has the most devastating fire weakness in the entire game, but that's okay. I'll let it go. Phase 2 is more the same. I'm gonna use a combination of her ice paths and black flame to attack the great wood from afar and after about 5 minutes the tree goes down and we get to make like a tree ourselves and leaf. The crystal sage is the first boss we fought so far aside from Gundir that isn't completely immune to frostbite and this means we'll be doing a large amount of damage to him. Since this fight isn't particularly difficult, I think this is a good time to talk about where Frida's Great Scythe ranks amongst the other frostbite weaponry in the game. For starters, it is one of four weapons that can natively inflict frostbite without use of a weapon art, and it ranks second just below Vort's Great Hammer at building up frost. Interestingly, it's the only frost weapon that isn't related to Pontiff Sullivan in some way, and it's also the only scythe on the list. Jumping into the next one, the Abyss Watchers fight was fairly even. Because we both have zero poise, this one was a bit of a slobber knocker and we basically just took turns launching each other in the air and flying across the room. I had a lot of fun with this one. I tried using Frida's invisibility to safely fight the main watcher without interference from the others, but that didn't really work out so well. Once he's in phase 2, a mistimed dash gets me hit and after dodging a few attacks, I move in for some of my own. We end up trading here as my ice connects and now I'm in some serious trouble. At this point, the boss could look at me funny and I might die. I risk it all and go for an ice jump which scores a direct hit and the explosion launches him in the air. I try to finish him off while he's on the ground but I'm out of stamina. Fortunately, he whiffs a dash attack and after a few attempts, the abyss watchers are no more. I mentioned this in my Artorias run but the stray demon is a weird one. He isn't technically a boss because he doesn't have a fog gate or a boss HP bar, but he does give you a boss soul when defeated, so I figured I'd throw him in. The wide range on Frida's sights make it easy to attack both legs at once, which are destructible, and if you can manage to destroy them, then you can score a free repost on his head. After dodging his jump attack, one more combo, and I'm off to the- I can't believe I'm saying this, but the Deacon's fight was actually pretty close. While the majority of it was just me doing my best Dynasty Warriors impression, the ending was intense. Bloodied but unbowed, we make our way over to Smoldering Lake for a showdown with the old Demon King. This is the third optional boss fight in our run so far and he wasn't to be trifled with. His molten hot exterior means that he is completely immune to frostbite so we were going to have to do this the old fashioned way. 
Thankfully, the old Demon King's boss arena is spacious and this allows Frida to jump and dash to her heart's content. When he goes for the meteors, I take the opportunity to set up some ice trails and the magic damage tears him apart. A poorly spaced jump into this ring of fire puts me in range of a one shot, but a nice jump gets me out of danger while sending me into phase 3. This is when the old Demon King usually overheats, but another ice trail snuffs out his flames once and for all. Wolnir. In previous runs, this is where the difficulty usually begins to spike, and this run was no exception. I fought Sullivan numerous times in this session, and we had some nail-biting sets. He starts off the fight with this lunge 99% of the time, and knowing this, I was able to set up an ice trail. Once I'm behind him, I dodge an attack, and then I'm going to set up an ice trap for him to lunge forward into. I'm doing my best to stay close because I know Frida has the speed to keep up with him, but I need to be careful because the Pontiff is just as fast. Our favorite move, the ice jump, sends him directly into phase 2 and I fly a little too close to the sun here as I try to punish his transformation sequence. He should be going for a clone here soon so I wait it out and when he finally does I'm gonna stack two ice traps on top of each other so the explosions can take care of the clone. We get really lucky here when Pontiff's thrust doesn't convert into a grab, and just like that, we've got a one-way ticket to Anne Orlando. If you've ever fought Frida before, then you're probably asking yourself why I haven't been healing myself, and the answer is simple. I can't. The move just isn't available in this mod, and honestly, I'm fine with that. For me, a large part of what makes Frida so fun in the first place is that she's as frail as a snowflake, especially on max new game difficulty. It feels so much more rewarding when you can beat a boss knowing that you could have easily died in two or three hits. In my Dragon Slayer or Nameless King runs, I felt like a kaiju fighting other kaijus, but Frida, by comparison, is quite the opposite. If you can manage to string together her vast combination of moves in a fluid way, then you can easily overcome even the most difficult bosses regardless of how frail she is. Speaking of difficult bosses, Aldrich was just as annoying as he always is but preemptively setting ice trails on his spawn points made him even less annoying. Dodging his attacks wasn't particularly difficult as Frida, but once I got around all the soul mass and arrows, Aldrich reminded me that he also had a sight. The only difference is that his is much bigger and also heals him when he hits you with it. I'm gonna do about a fourth of the God Eater's HP with this flashy looking move and then one more combo since Aldrich packing. The Yorm fight was the ultimate test of my patience. It was about 13 minutes long and the entire thing was just me kiting Yorm with ice trails and hoping to get lucky enough to hit his head with one of the explosions so I could go for a repost. I'm gonna spare you the agony of watching the entirety of this fight, but just know that I was very tempted to pick up that Storm Ruler. The next three bosses are, on paper, supposed to be some of the easiest. That's because each one is known for being susceptible to the frostbite status, which can be reset by hitting the boss with the fire move, which we don't have. In case you're unfamiliar, the way status effects work in this game is that once you inflict an opponent with a status, they're put on a timer and can't be inflicted again until that timer runs out. Frostbite is the only exception, as hitting them with a fire move will reset the timer and allow them to be inflicted over and over again. This is what makes Frida and Ariandel such a good duo. Frida freezes you and Ariandel uses his flames to reset the timer so that Frida can freeze you all over again. Anyway, Osiris was scary, but he was nothing more than a warm up for the real boss in this area, Champion Gundir. Where do I even start with this guy? One of the most effective ways of dealing with a champion is by parrying him, but we don't have that option. As you can tell by the blood stain on the ground, I had to fight him quite a few times and I think this is one of the best fights. I start off with an ice jump for some solid damage and then I'm going to back off to see what Gundir wants to go for. He has 185 poise and it takes about 10 seconds for his poise to fully recover, so you need to make sure you stay on him and keep the pressure on even if it's just a few black flames. After losing about 30% of his health, he switches into phase 2. I make a huge mistake and get very greedy. It's getting down to the wire and judging from the damage on that last grab, I cannot take another.
we were just a second away from losing that fight. That was a close one. I never noticed this before, but the Dragon Slayer armor and Frida have similar stances and similar moves. For example, we can drag our Sice along the ground just like he can drag his axe. Anyway, the cramped area here made for some heartbreaking fights. When you do take him on, the Dragon Slayer usually goes for a lunge, which you can easily avoid without even rolling. My follow up attack is scuffed, and I lose about 60% of my HP as a result. I decided to start by playing a little safer and throw some black flames here and there. Don't ask me why I grab my souls here, I think it's just a reflex. I try to sneak in an L1, but the Dragon Slayer isn't having any of it. I'm going to provoke him a little bit here before repositioning with the Frida Jump and going for an Ice Trail, which almost gets me killed. The Ice staggers him, and as he transforms, I'm able to get a combo off. I pick a terrible time to attack him here and now I've only got about a pixel left. I go for some ice attack so I can chip away at the Dragon Slayer while he's defending. That's when I almost throw it all away with this very questionable leap. Two R1s later though, and the Dragon Slayer has been slain. Oh man, if you've seen any of my previous runs, then you know that the Twin Princes are my Achilles heel. They are the Lightning Bolts to my Stone Scales, the Black Knight to my Fire Demon, the Manus to my Artor- Okay, you, you get what I'm trying to say, these guys are usually pretty bad for me. This time was different though, because Frida has some phenomenal tools for dealing with this boss. The most important one is probably her ice traps, which Lorien has a really hard time dealing with because of how slowly he moves. Their vast throne room also gives Frida the freedom to set ice trails anywhere, and the most useful one in my opinion is the one that she can do while she's running. This makes it so that you can safely pressure the princes while staying out of danger. About 4 minutes into the fight, I get clipped by Lorien after he goes for a standing attack and a Frida jump helps me avoid his overhead slash. After Lothar revives his brother, the best thing you can do as Frida is stack ice traps and if you do it correctly then you can force Lothric to revive Lorien again since each time he's revived he has less HP than he did before and this will kind of put them in an endless loop until Lothric dies or you mess up like I did. Once Lothric's HP is low enough you can finish him off with one simple combo. This boss was one of my favorite fights in this video, and you're about to see why. I open up with a black flame jump right on the King of the Storm's head, and it does nearly half of his HP bar. After two more hits, it's obvious that the Nameless King has had enough, and that's when he takes flight. Once he eventually lands, I go for a jump attack, and... Now it's time for phase 2. I could have easily dashed here, but Frida Jump looks so much cooler. Once I'm up close, I can literally run circles around the Nameless King. The Nameless King is fairly resistant to frostbite, so we aren't hitting nearly as hard as we could be, but that's okay because we aren't getting hit either. After a bit of back and forth, I do get a poise break off, and while he's recovering from the repost, I go for an ice jump. This is almost always the best thing to do in the situation. One last ice jump, and it's curtains for- wait, hold on a second, how did that miss? That's more like it. For the soul of Cinder... Wait a second, am I forgetting something? No, I don't think so. Okay, as I mentioned in the beginning, Frida is the sister of Yuria, one of the NPCs you can summon to help you with the soul of Cinder, and as siblings, the two of them have their differences. What if they put these differences aside to take on the final boss of the main game? When this fight starts, I immediately take point, and frankly, that was a mistake. Yuria has way better tools for holding aggro because of her Estus and the Dark Hand which she'll primarily be using as a shield. 
In fact, out of all the small shields in the entire game, the Dark Hand has the best lightning and fire resistance, and that'll definitely help out in this fight. This is offset by its low stability though, so that means she won't be able to tank for long. Knowing this, I make sure to tag out with Yuria often, and following a bit of teamwork, Cinder enters Phase 2. Phase 2 is an entirely different beast. In just one hit, he wipes out a third of my HP bar. Yuria is doing her best to rack up bleed damage with her katana, but she does get caught up in his 5 hit combo. We're going to regroup here and that's when Cinder throws a lightning bolt. Yuria's shield takes a beating, but that gives me the opportunity to go for some black flames. While Yuria is holding his attention, I charge up one final attack. Now all that's left for me to do is to link the flame. But in this what if scenario, there is no way Yuria will let me do that. As the eldest sister, Frida is likely the strongest, and using both of her sights to overwhelm her opponent is the key to her success. Yuria, on the other hand, no pun intended, is in my opinion, ironically, the more cold and calculating sister, preferring to carefully chip away at her opponents with the bleed status from her katana, while hiding behind the safety of her makeshift shield. Versus Frida, that shield does not hold up. One thing Yuria does have going for her is that the Dark Drift she wields has the lowest stamina consumption of every katana, which was basically the opposite of me, who was starving for stamina the entire fight. As long as you can manage that, then Yuria doesn't hold a candle to her unkindled kin. Neither did the Grave Tender and his wolf, whose boss fight was annoying at most. Frida's ice trails are remarkably effective at overcoming the gank squad, and switching into phase 3 is highly recommended for this one because Frida's black flame is fast and can hit multiple targets at once. When the grave tender summons poor man Sif, all you have to do is keep your distance and you should be fine. After that warm up, it was finally time to take on my imposter. When this fight starts, I go into phase 3 and jump right behind Frida dodging an ice jump from her in the process. Some slow attacks are going to catch her dashes and a timely dash of my own gets me out of danger. Black Flame is amazing in this fight because it'll interrupt most of what she goes for due to how low her poise is. Even though she's completely immune to Frostbite, a luxury I actually forgot to give myself, the explosions will launch her in the air and you can set up an Ice Jump or Flame Jump or whatever you want to go for. Whenever Frida goes invisible, even when you're not playing as Frida, you should never really get hit by that attack because if you just run counterclockwise, then you can pretty much always get a backstab out of it. When Frida's HP is low enough, I have no choice but to style on her. Phase 2 versus myself took lots of trial and error, but eventually I realized that if you line them up just right, you can basically keep Frida launched while hitting both of them at the same time. This cheesy tactic evaporates their shared HP bar, and it only works because, despite his size, Arendelle's defenses are even worse than Frida's. Eventually, I do make it to phase 3, and our first encounter was intense. If you've ever died to that move, then you can pay your respects by liking the video. In the rematch, I started going for backstabs after Frida missed her flame jump, and doing so will set you up for one of your own. Neither of us really wants to die here, so we're taking turns throwing ice and flames at each other from across the field. I'm gonna be honest with you guys, my nerves got the best of me here, and I made what should have been a huge mistake by going for an R2. But fortunately, Frida misses an ice trap. Now that I finally defeated her, I can finally say that the cold never bothered me anyway. I think the demons are Frida's best matchup, hands down. Between the huge arena, their large model sizes, and their mediocre slash and magic defense, I had a field day in this fight. I mean, just look at how much damage the demon and pain took from that combo. Crazy, right? Throw in the fact that their attacks are so slow, and you would have to go out of your way to lose this fight. I killed the burnt out demon first, but you'll want to focus on whichever one is flaming since that's usually the more dangerous one. Frida's outstanding speed gives you a ton of leeway when it comes to dodging their attacks, 
and it isn't difficult at all to find an opening for a repost. By the time the Demon Prince's transformation ends, he's already lost 40% of his HP, and to make matters worse, I can just jump over his fireballs. Here I'm going to dash right through its gust of wind, and as he powers up the base cannon, I'm able to sneak behind him and win the fight. Half-Light is a joke to Frida, until he randomly decides that he isn't. The good news here is that a lot of your attacks launch him in the air, and as long as you stay on top of backstabbing the Guardians that spawn in, then your L1 in Phase 3 should make short work of Half-Light. If Frida ever had to fight Madeir, then I think she would have a terrible time. The one thing really working in her favor is her amazing speed. As you can see from this footage here, I'm able to weave in and out of combat at a moment's notice. So why is this fight so bad? Well, aside from the fact that he's basically immune to everything, his model's head sits so high above the ground that the explosions from her ice attacks often miss. On top of that, he can kill me in just two or three attacks depending on what he goes for. When Madeir takes flight, I run the opposite way and I'm able to use Frida's jump to get close to his head where he eventually lands. Whenever he breathes fire and remains stationary, I set up ice trails aimed at his legs, but here I get greedy and go for a jump too. I recover nicely though, but another careless mistake puts me in one-shot territory. When you're at mid-range with Madeir, you absolutely have to look out for his lunge, because he can easily wipe out over half of Frida's HP bar. Madeir goes into phase 2 and starts rampaging, and after surviving that, I dodge a dark attack. At this point, I don't even know how I'm still alive. Slowly but surely though, I chip away at Madeir, and this time when he takes flight, I set up a flame jump right where he lands. After returning to phase 3, Madeir finally falls. This is the final fight, and I'm just going to say it now, fighting Gale as Frida is some of the most fun I have ever had in this game. For Frida, Gale is remarkably easy to stagger, so when the ice explodes, I make sure to capitalize with my scythe. I'm able to stay just out of Gale's range, and after placing an ice trail, the real fight begins, and this one speaks for itself. <laughs> 